Setting up development environments is hard, especially when working with serious or big systems. So let's try to make it a bit easier. Most of the time, it is easy to set up whatever we need to work on a specific application. Visual Studio Code, Terminal, Docker or a local Kubernetes cluster, a few other tools and we're ready to go. Those are not the problem. I'm sure that every single developer is perfectly capable of setting up everything needed to work on whichever application he or she is working on. Code? Easy. Building binaries and container images? Not a problem. Running tests? Piece of cake. Building and running tests every time we make a change to the code? Well, why not? Heck, we might even offload some of that to remote environments so that easy becomes even easier. However, the problem is readily the application we are working on, unless we are working on something silly like WebLogic, but if that's the case, you might want to look for a new job rather than improvements I'm about to discuss. So, what is the issue? The real problem is everything else. Everything but the app we are working on. You might be working on a backend application that is being used by a separate frontend application. That frontend application might need a few other backend applications to function properly. Each of those backend apps might be making calls to a few other backend apps. Then we might have databases, message queues, caches, and so on and so forth. How do we deal with that? Do we install and maintain all those dependencies locally? If we do, our laptops might crush under heavy load. And even if that does not happen, we'll be spending most of our time installing, configuring, and maintaining all those dependencies. Remember, it is not a one-time thing. It's a continuous process. All those are changing all the time. And if we run them locally, we'll have to keep up with all those changes. There is a new release of a dependent backend application. Well, upgrade the local instance of it. Database was upgraded. Upgrade the local instance of it. Database schema was changed. Apply the change to the local instance of the database. You get the point, right? It's hard. And frankly, it's a waste of time. All that time that each of us would need to spend maintaining a copy of a production-like system could be better spent working on the application we are supposed to be working on. That's the real goal here, right? So, what is the alternative? One option is to use production-like environments. You probably have it. You might call it pre-production or staging or something else. It's a cluster where all the apps are running and it is similar to production. We typically use it for testing of one kind or another. However, if we do have such an environment and if we do develop locally or even remotely, the questions we should ask are, first, how does the app we are working on communicate with the rest of the system? And second, how does the rest of the system communicate with the app we are working on? How are we going to solve those issues? Let's start with the first one since it is easier to deal with. If the app we are working on needs to talk to another app, we can simply configure our application with the DNS of the one running remotely. Right? Well, not really. If you are working locally and the app we want to talk to is remote, we would need to open it to outside traffic. Well, that is okay in some cases, front-end apps being the most obvious example. It is a bad idea in others, specifically those not designed to be accessible outside of the cluster where they are running. We would need to expose that remote application specifically for development purposes. And while that might not be the end of the world, it is not ideal. On the other hand, if you're developing remotely inside the same cluster where baseline applications are running, things are much easier, since all we would have to do is make sure that our app knows what the DNS of the other application is. So, we should just switch to remote development and adopt the tools that help us with that, like, for example, Octeto or Tilt? Well, maybe we should, but let's not rush into that decision until we talk about the second question. 
So here it goes. How does the rest of the system communicate with the app we are working on? Imagine this situation. We are working on a backend application that requires a database and is accessible through a front-end app. Database? Well, we already discussed that. Front-end app? Well, it's not that easy. If you are developing locally, we cannot easily instruct the front-end application to talk to our local instance of the application. It's your laptop and not a node in the cluster where that remote app is running. If we would run our application remotely, we could instruct the front-end app to talk to it, but that would be a terrible idea. It's a shared cluster and we would be interfering with other developers. The front-end app should talk to whomever it talks to, except if we explicitly tell it to talk to the app we are developing. That could be through request headers, URL paths, and so on and so forth. So it does not matter whether we are developing locally or remotely in the same cluster where the baseline apps are running. We need a solution to redirect traffic to and from baseline applications from and to the application we are developing. Now, the most common solution to that problem is telepresence. Yet, it never fit my needs fully for reasons I will not go through right now, right here. What matters is that I was looking for an alternative that is easier, more elegant, and yet one that does everything I needed to do. I think I might found it in Mirror D. So let's take a quick look at what it does and how it works. Imagine the following situation. I have a Kubernetes cluster that is similar to production. It's a production-like environment that they use for testing new releases before they are promoted to production. Here's a proof. I will send a request to one application, which in turn will send a request to another application, wait for the response and return it to me, return the output. And that's it, it works. It's not really production or production-like, but good enough to demonstrate some of the problems that MirrorD might or might not solve. It's a mystery for now at least. What matters is that there are two applications, Pinger and Silly Demo, each running as two replicas. Now, let me switch to a second terminal session from where I will be developing my application that happens to depend on one of those two apps. So, CD, Pinger, source. And now let's say that I finished writing changes to the code and I want to test them. Since the app is written in Go, I will execute Go run to run it locally. Now, bear in mind that this video is not about apps written in Go. The principles and the solutions should work in almost any other language. Now that my app is running locally, let's see whether I can test it by using CURL to send a request to it. Now that over there failed miserably. My application, Pinger, complains that it cannot reach the dependent app Silly demo. Now, I could run Silly demo locally as well, but as we already discussed, that would uh, probably mean that I would need to run the whole system locally, and that's not something I want to do. My poor laptop would freak out, and I would have to spend more time in management of the local copy of the system than development. Now, let's solve that by instructing my local application to talk to the other apps as if it is running inside the cluster where the rest of the system is running. I'm going to stop my local application from running and run it again, but this time with a twist. So here's what the situation currently is. The remote application Pinger is talking to the remote application Silly Demo running in the same cluster. What I want to do is work on my local application that is mirroring that same application running in the cluster. So when I send a request from my local app, that request should go to the remote application as if my local application is running inside the cluster. So I want to fake it and make my local application behave as if it is running inside the cluster. So. I will use MirrorD to exec a local process that targets that same application running in a deployment called uh, Pinger. I will use demo as both the agent and the target namespace and 
Finally, I will instruct MirrorD to execute go run command that will run my application in the same way I run it earlier. You will notice that MirrorD is complaining about multipod deployments. Apart from my personal note that I believe that it would be enough to see the complaint once instead of so many times, I will ignore it for now. We'll get to it soon. Now, let's see what will happen if I send the same request again. Remember, the request failed before because it could not reach the silly demo application. What will happen now? Let's see. CURL with the same address and voila! This time it worked. The application I'm working on locally is connected to all the other applications running in the production-like cluster. I'm running it locally with all the advantages of doing just that while it still behaves as if it is running inside the same cluster where the rest of the system is running. My local application is mirroring its counterpart running inside the cluster. Moreover, my local application is not interrupting the system. Whomever else might be using the application running inside the cluster is oblivious to the fact that I'm running my local version of it. We can see what happened if we take a look at the pods in the demo namespace. When I run mirror the exec, it deployed an agent inside that namespace. MirrorD, running locally, is intercepting all the traffic from my application, redirecting it to the agent, which in turn is forwarding requests to whichever services the application would be using if it would be running inside the same cluster. MirrorD is effectively allowing me to work locally while being connected to the rest of the system. Now, having to write all those arguments was a bit tedious. So let's try to simplify that by using a configuration file config.json. Over there, we can see the same arguments I used before. There is the path and the namespace of the target application, as well as the namespace of the agent. Now, let's run mirror the exec again, but this time, instead of specifying all the arguments, we'll use the configuration file. If I send a request to the application using CURL, the result is the same. And that's cool, right? That was the easier problem to solve. So let's try something more complex. I'll switch to a different application located in the silly demo source directory. Over here, I have a different MirrorD configuration. Apart from the target and the agent that we already saw, this time I'm adding uh, one of uh, quite a few MirrorD features. I will instruct it to steal incoming requests from the target application running on the port 8080. Effectively, what I want is the ability to send requests to the remote application, which should forward them to my local application instead of the app running inside the cluster. Let's see whether that works by executing mirrord exec again. This time I will send 50 requests to the remote app. We can distinguish output from the local application by the with mirrord message. So let's run the loop. The output is strange. Approximately half of the requests were handled by the remote dependency, those without with mirror the message, while the other half of the requests were handled by the local application. I mean, those are the ones that contain with mirror the message. So, what's happening? Well, I have two replicas of the remote app, and the free version of mirror the works only on a single pod. Now. That is the intentional limitation of the open source version of MirrorD, which we can overcome by using MirrorD for teams, which we will discuss later. On the other hand, there is probably no need to run multiple replicas of an application in production-like environments unless we are running load testing, which is not the case here. So if your application-like cluster is running a single replica of each app, you should be fine. Or maybe not. We'll see. There's another issue with the open source version of MirrorD. Since MirrorD attaches itself to specific pods, 
it would be interesting to see what happens if those pods are removed by, let's say, a new release. We'll test that by deleting all the pods from the silly demo app. That's not a new release, but the effect is the same. Since those pods are managed by a deployment, it detected that pods are not running and created new ones. Now, let's send another 50 requests to the remote application. This time, MirrorD did not steal any of the requests. The pod it was stealing from is not running anymore. We'll talk about that in a moment. For now, I want to discuss a different problem. Stealing all the traffic from a remote application is a very bad idea. That effectively means that no one else can use that application in the production-like environment since their requests would be forwarded to my local application as well. What we need is to distinguish my requests from everyone else's. My requests to the remote app should be forwarded to my local application while everyone else should be forwarded to the application running inside the cluster. We can do that with MirrorD as well. Let's take a look at a better configuration file. This one is almost the same as the previous config. The difference is in the header filter value set to test MirrorD. I'm sure that you can guess what it will do, but Let's see it in action, nevertheless. Here it goes. Mirror D, exec, again, but with the improved configuration. And then I will be sending 50 requests to the remote app and nothing. All the requests were forwarded from the remote app to the other remote app in the same cluster. None of them reached my local instance of the application. Does that make me sad? Well, not at all. That's good news. I did not include the special header in my requests, so they were not forwarded to my local application. The remote application behaved as it should behave when somebody else is using it. And what everyone else should see is uninterrupted traffic between the applications running in that cluster. Now, let's do the same 50 requests, but this time with the special Header. This time, MirrorD did forward requests to my local application, or to be more precise, it forwarded those coming from one of the pods, since, as I already mentioned, the open source version of MirrorD works only on a single pod. Finally, once I'm finished developing my application locally, all I have to do is stop the MirrorD process. That, in turn, will automatically remove the agent from the cluster. We can see that by listing all the pods in the demo namespace. It's still there. Let's give it a moment more and get the pods again. And there we go. Now it's gone as if it was never there. Now I want to move to the commercial version of MirrorD, but before I do, let me say that there are quite a few other options we can define in the configuration file. Also, there is a Visual Studio Code extension that makes it easy to debug applications while still mirroring and stealing traffic from and to the apps running inside the cluster. Now, let's move to the commercial version of MirrorD. MirrorD open source has quite a few issues, many of them caused by omission that can be fixed with a commercial version called MirrorD for Teams. To begin with, MirrorD, the open source version, spins up containers with privileged permissions, which is likely not what you want to do. On top of that, it fails miserably when multiple developers want to work against the same application running in a cluster. Finally, it does not work well with multi-replica deployments. In other words, if you're working solo or there are only a few of you and you do not deploy new releases to the cluster and you have no problem with privileged access, the open source version might be good enough for you. That means that MirrorD is not a good fit for anything but hobby projects or companies with only a few employees. If that's the case, you probably do not have a large-scale system to justify the need for something like MirrorD. What that really means is that the open source version is not a typical project that hopes to be adopted by companies first and then, once it grows in adoption, 
to start charging for an enterprise version. You can think of MirrorD as a trial version of the commercial offering, which contains a limited set of capabilities. It is open source and it is free forever, but it is not useful to almost anyone for anything but a single person trying it out before making the decision to purchase the license for the commercial version. So, what's the commercial version of MirrorD? To begin with, it's called MirrorD for Teams. That name suits it well. It is a requirement for any team planning to use it. What does it do? Well, the four teams edition provides an operator that does the heavy lifting inside the cluster and it enables teams of any size, more or less, to use MirrorD without any of the before mentioned limitations of the open source version. Now, to be clear, those are my best guesses. MirrorD for teams is in a closed beta at the time of this recording and it might change by the time it goes GA. Moreover, there is no information about the pricing nor even whether it is commercial. So, for all I know, it might be free as well, even though I don't think that's very likely. Anyways, if you feel that MirrorD might be a good fit for your organization, I strongly, strongly suggest joining the beta program or if it went GA by the time you're watching this video to get the commercial version. Okay. Now that we went through both the open source and the commercial versions of MirrorD, we are ready to talk about pros and cons, or cons and pros, and see whether you should use it. Let me start by saying that MirrorD is a direct competitor to telepresence. Is it a better option? Well, before we get the answer to that question, let's see what the pros and cons of MirrorD are. And we'll go with cons first. Let me start with the most obvious negative point to MirrorD. Documentation is bad. The quick start does not show what the main features of MirrorD are. It does not even mention stealing traffic, which from my perspective is the start feature of the project. Configuration section is going all over the place and contains quite a few pieces of incorrect information. I could go on and on and on with the problems related to docs, but I won't, because you get the point, right? It's bad. Now, this is a project in an early stage and documentation is often something that gets improved later. So I expect it to get improved soon. Heck, by the time you're watching this video and given sufficient pressure to mirror the team, it should be much better by now. So documentation is hopefully a temporary problem. A bigger issue is that open source version of the project is useless for anything but a single person to try it out before deciding to purchase the commercial version. Open source version is not something I would recommend to anyone planning to use it seriously. Now, let's switch around and uh, go towards pros, the good things. And the first one is that if I ignore the deficiencies of the open source version and I focus only on MirrorD for Teams, I can safely say that it is the most elegant solution of the kind that I've seen so far. MirrorD for Teams is a great product. It is very easy to use, assuming that you figure out how it works in the first place through the docs. It does what it's supposed to do. It does not waste more resources than needed and so on and so forth. So the first and the only pro is that it is great, as long as you don't use the open source version. All in all, MirrorD open source is not something I would recommend to anyone unless you want to try it out before purchasing the commercial version. Now, if you do want to get MirrorD for Teams, the commercial version, I can safely say that it is a great product and that you should get it. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Cheers.